This morning, I would like to look at the subject of life and death as revealed in the epistles of John. I don't think it is difficult for us as we look at the physical life to know what's life, living or what's dead. Look at the tree. If I were to ask you which part of that tree is alive, I think you would tell me rightly. Surely you wouldn't talk about those, those branches don't have any leaves. Life and death. We can see the difference in the physical world. We can understand that here is a body that's animated and it's active, it's alive. And then we also know that lifeless form in the, in the casket when we go to a funeral. Life and death physically is something that we can discern, but we need help from God sometime to understand the spiritual death and the spiritual life. People can be walking down the streets this day and they are. They're following the course of this world as Ephesians, the second chapter, verses one through three tells us. That indeed they're living according to their pleasures, due to the desires of the flesh and of the mind, by nature the children of wrath. They are dead in their sins, but they walk according to the course of this world. The walking dead. And we think those people are alive, but they're the walking dead. When a woman gives herself to pleasure, she's dead, 1 Timothy 5, 6, while she liveth. She's living, she's enjoying her pleasure, she's active, and yet she's dead. That spiritual death, sometimes it's hard for us to not only see in others, but also to see in ourselves. It's not so recognizable as we would a dead tree or a live body. So this morning, we need to see from God's Word about the life that he's talking about in his Word, especially in the epistles of John, and also to see about this thing called death. It will go two ways. It will go in our relationship with God, and it will go in our relationship with one another. We begin by understanding this life. What is this life that God has promised us? I think we find a direct answer to that in 1 John 2 and verse 25. This is the promise which he promised us, even the life eternal. He does not say just spiritual life. He says this spiritual life that he is, promise, is promising is indeed life eternal. How do we know about that life? It's because it's the word of life that's been revealed to us. 1 John 1 and 2. The people had heard from the beginning and that they indeed had handled and beheld and touched this word of life. Verse 2, the life was manifested and we have seen him bear witness and declaring to you the life, the eternal life. Notice he emphasizes this which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. How is it manifested unto us? The word of life became flesh, John 1 and verse 14. Dwelt among us, we heard him, we beheld him, we touched him. He is the word of life. What kind of life? It's the word of eternal life. He emphasizes that all through the epistles of John. Titus tells us, that we can have the confidence of our salvation because it's been promised unto us by God. Why is that important? God who cannot lie promised before times eternal. This hope of eternal life that we have was promised before times eternal. Could you tell me when a point of time takes place before times eternal? I can't. There's no point of time before time's eternal. This has been something always in the mind of God. Eternal life. That he wanted God, God's people to have eternal life. Because we see the route that it took beginning in Genesis. But this was, is an eternal promise. This eternal life is an eternal promise. It is the quality of life that inspires us with hope. We have hope of eternal life. And what an inspiration to know in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, that our inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And it's based upon what Jesus Christ has done. In fact, he is the one that begat us again by a living hope 
and a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead to the point that we can read in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 1 that Jesus Christ is our hope. It's just centered in him that we have hope of eternal life. And we know the quality of life. It will never fade away. It's incorruptible. It is undefiled. It's promised by one who cannot lie. We made, we've got that life revealed to us in his son. And the promise is eternal life. So I'm looking at eternal life as being this idea of life. And it's found only in Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, 4 and verse 9, what was the purpose of Jesus coming? He tells us. Herein was the love of God manifested in us, manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. What do you think living? What quality of life of living is he talking about? He's only been talking about eternal life. We want to live eternally and we'll, we'll be through him. Therefore, it should not surprise us at the end of this epistle, 1 John 5 and verse 11, the witness of God is unto us is eternal life. Where is this life? It is in his Son. He that hath, the Son hath the life. What life? Eternal life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not the life. I've written unto you that you may know that you have, what kind of life? Eternal life, verse 13. Even unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Life, eternal life, as John will emphasize, is found only in the Son. And it's this eternal life that's been promised to you and me and made known through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, can we have it now? Do we have eternal life now as we believe on the Son and follow Him? Well, in Luke 18:30. We'll find, no, in the sense of the glorified state, we don't. Peter had left all and followed him along with the other uh, disciples. They left father and mother, they left their wife as they went about following Jesus. And he's expressing unto them, Jesus responds to them, they have left all, are going to receive manifold in this world, and in the world to come, eternal life. So when we think about eternal life, most people think, no, I don't have eternal life. I've got spiritual life, but I don't have eternal life at this time because Jesus says it's going to come in the world to come and understand that. But that's life in its glorified state. We do not have that. We're not in a glorified body. But does that mean we don't have eternal life? He says you have it present tense in 1 John 5. Oh, that just means eternal life in prospect. We have it in hope. I understand that. But I want us to see from God's Word, especially from 1 John, and from other passages of Scripture, when you start describing this life, when did it begin? Paul says that we were made alive in Christ. We were dead in sins and made alive. And the first thing that comes to mind, that's spiritual life. Let me ask you, what's the quality of that life? It's spiritual. Anything else? What if we added to that it's eternal in its nature? Doesn't it mean you can't lose it. The door you went into of believing Jesus is the door you can come out of and, and fall away from that promise of eternal life. But what's the nature of this life? If you have the Son, you've got eternal life, he says. I write these things so that you know you have it. You believe on the name of the Son of God. And it began when we first became alive. Eternal life doesn't have a beginning, but I can come into eternal life when I have come alive in Christ. Now let's see how Jesus looked at this. He contrasts the physical with the spiritual. Turn with me to John 11. Here's the setting. Lazarus, dead. Jesus is going to raise him from the dead in just a few moments. And he's talking to Martha. And Martha says in John 11 and verse 25 about the fact that she knows that indeed uh, that he will rise again at the resurrection of the, day, uh, uh, in the resurrection of the last day. Verse 24. Then Jesus says this. I am the resurrection and the life. Our resurrection and the life. 
He says, he that believeth on me, though he die, yet shall he live. Jesus is the resurrection. Believe it on him. I'm going to be, re I'm dying. I am a believer. And though I die, I shall live. But that's not the end of it. Whosoever liveth keeps on believing. He shall never die. He shall never die. Believe thou this, my brother, no, I don't. You don't have eternal life until you're raised from the dead. Jesus says, here's the physical, we die, we go to the grave, I'm the resurrection. But if you're living and you keep believing, you will never die. die you'll never die physically? No. You'll never die spiritually. Condition, keep on believing. You'll never die. What's, what's the nature of never dying? Eternal life. That's the life he gives. That's the life he wants us to know that we have. It's conditional. It begins when we confess Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. We're baptized into his name. And we find the eunuch. What, what hinders me to be baptized? That thou believest thou mayest. And he confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Peter says the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, when he made that good confession. So there is confessing, putting our hope upon Jesus as the source of eternal life. And then we're baptized into his name. He that believeth on the name has eternal life. I want you to know you have it. Even them that believe, keep on believing on his name. When did that start? I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Brought into relationship with him. It begins there and it continues. As we continue to submit to the authority of the Son of God. And abide in his doctrine. In 2 John. Well, we notice we cannot go onward and abide not in the, the doctrine of God, if we, uh, Christ. If we do that, we don't have the Father, we do not have the Son. But look what he says in verse 8, leading up to that. Look to yourselves, that you lose not the things which you have wrought, but that you receive a full reward. We can be unfaithful. We can be led astray and not receive our full reward. I've got eternal life. I don't have it in its glorified state yet. That's what I'm going for. I want to remain faithful until I, in the world to come, I have eternal life in that sense. But let's don't forget, that's what I have now. Because I believe in the name. I keep on believing, as Jesus said, I will never die. It's the nature of this life. It's eternal life. Conditional, but we're, we have it. Now let's see how it works toward our brethren. In 1 John 3 and verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. I've come out of death. What kind of death is that? Well, that's spiritual death. Could, it, could, it be, could that same death become okay, eternal death? Yeah. Are you in eternal death right now? Well, I can come out of it. Yes, it's conditional. But you're dead. You're separated from God. And you'll continue to be in hell. But I passed out. And here's the manifestation. I passed out of death into life. What kind of life is that? I'm suggesting to you it's eternal life. John says it's nothing else. And we notice that in 1 John 2 and verse 9, under the metaphors of light and darkness, it says, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in the darkness even until now. Here is the dawn of Jesus and his expression of what love truly is coming upon the world. And if you don't love your brother, it's not dawning on you. You're abiding in darkness even until now while the sun's coming up. You're still in darkness. But when you show love toward your brethren, that is showing that you have come out of death into life. But if you do not love your brethren, you abideth in death. You abideth in death. And I want you to notice how he speaks about not loving your brethren. You're a murderer. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. It's the way John puts it. 
Marvel not, brethren, if the world hateth you, verse 13. We know he passed out of death and life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Is a murderer. See, John won't allow you to, well, I got a little, I got a little gray area between light and darkness. I got a little something in the middle between uh, life and death. I got something in between hate and not loving. No, you ain't gonna, if you don't love your brother, you hate them. You love not your brethren, you hate them. And when you hate them, don't love, you're a murderer. And here is what is interesting to me. You know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. I couldn't ever have it in the first place till the judgment. Eternal life is after the world to come. What do you mean? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have eternal life abiding. I wasn't going to get it until later. No. John said you got it now. And when you don't love your brethren, you show you're not, eternal life is not abiding in you. How can something abide in you that never was there? It's there. But what I'm showing is that you don't have eternal life abiding in you. Because you're not manifesting love to your brethren. How do we do that? How could we ever be a murderer? Jesus says the attitude of Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But if you're angry with your brother, you're going to be in danger of the judgment. If you say raka, which showed a, 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 a sense of contempt, an expression of contempt. And if you say moron, thou fool, that's where we get our word moron, you're in danger of hell fire. Notice the contempt that is there, that is in the heart of people that can grow so much that I'll just blow you away. You don't deserve to, to breathe the same air that I breathe. You're, you're a rock god, you're a fool. Out of the way. Well, the next step is murdering. And Jesus was pointing out, you control the attitude of your heart because you can have the heart of a murderer. And if you love not your brethren, you're hating them. How does that come out? Titus 3, 3 through 5, he speaks about the world in darkness. We're, we're doing the desires of our flesh. We're, we're, we're being disobedient. We're being foolish. But he also says, we're living in malice. Hateful, hating one another. That's what we were in the world. When we envy people, we sometimes have malice in our heart. We don't want anything good to happen to them. They got something we don't. We envy them. It's not that we would like to have it. We just don't like them having it. Jealousy says, I like to have what they have. Envy says, I don't care about that. I just don't like him being praised. So malice comes in, hateful, hating one another. Apparently that can happen between brethren. And when you do manifest that, you're showing that eternal life is not abiding in you. But I want to add to it, when we ignore brethren who need our help, eternal death is waiting for us. Eternal punishment is waiting for us. Jesus taught this in Matthew 25. Where people were hungry and thirsty. They were strangers. They were naked. They were sick. They were in prison. And when certain ones saw after those needs, verse 40 that you did it unto the least of my brethren. These brethren, my least of my brethren. They're going to be in a place of eternal life. There's a place prepared for them. But there's a place prepared in hell for those who do not. So in verse 45 through 46, those who do not do these things, they're going to eternal punishment, but the others into eternal life into that glorified state of eternal life. We cannot be having malice in our heart toward our brothers and sisters, neither can we allow the least 
to fall through the cracks that we don't care when they need our help. We're not showing love to our brethren when we do that. And I think it shows, as John says, we don't have eternal life continuing to abide in us when we do that. A lot of people will like a religion that says, I'll just get holy with God. I read my Bible. I don't have to deal with the public. I don't have to deal with the government. I can just be holy with God. I don't have to worry about my other relationships. And I think I, I'm going to heaven on that. But you start having to deal with the government that's over you and making decisions concerning our relationship with the government or relationship with our brethren. Sometimes it gets difficult for us. We lack the humility sometimes to look to the very least of our brethren and to keep on the course, and we can't do that. Eternal life is in us. But when we start showing an attitude that's not right toward our brethren, we're showing it's not abiding in us because a murderer hath no life in him. Now, think about that. I think about a lot of murderers that's still alive. I mean, he doesn't have any life in him. That's the declaration from heaven. You can rationalize all you want to. Murderer hath no eternal life abiding in him. That's the direction from God. That's the fact. That's the way it is. And so I want to be showing I passed out of death into a life. What life? I'm saying it's eternal life. Now, here's a relationship in prayer. In 1 John 5 and verse 14, this is the boldness which we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So we've asked anything, what is it, what is it? According to his will, he hears us. Next step. Now, if he hears us, verse 15, we know that if he heareth us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions or the request which we have asked of him. And so we begin to realize here's the confidence. Now, where does our confidence and boldness lie in our prayers? It hinges around it's according to his will. I can pray according to his will that he's revealed. But sometimes I may be asking things with God that's not revealed yet. My particular life. I don't know what's out there. God, I want it to be according to your will. Because that's a condition. 1 John 3, 22, he adds two more, which are connected here. Keeping his commandments. There's his will. Doing what's pleasing in his sight. That's his will. And when we're living that way, we can have boldness that our prayers will be answered. It hinges upon, it's according to his will. Keeping his commandments. Doing what's pleasing in his sight. And that's the way we ought to, to live. So our prayers will be answered. But what about intercessory prayer? John says, what about the fellow that you see sinning? Should I pray for him? If he asks me to pray for him, should I pray for him? What is the will of God on this matter? If any man see his brother sinning a sin, not unto death, he shall ask, and God will give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, not concerning this do I say that you should make request. All righteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. What's the will of God? I can pray for a brother or a sister who sins not unto death. But God says, it's not my will. I don't want you praying for one that sins unto death. Well, apparently I can see the difference. When you see a brother sinning a sin not unto death, when you see a brother sinning a sin unto death, that's the key. I can pray for one, can't pray for the other. So what is this thing I see? Well, if I were in the Catholic Church, it'd be pretty easy. There are mortal sins. Can't get out of that one. Venial sins, they're not as important. They're not as... So give me the list. 
Here are the venial sins. Here are sins that may be maybe not under eternal death. It's not mortal. And I can, I can pray for you if you do these sins. Let me go look them up in the catechism. But here's mortal sins. Too bad. Can't pray for that one. Is that the way we do it? I think the Bible gives us help in this. That what is the sin that's not unto death? It's a sin that someone confesses, 1 John 1, repents, Acts 8, 22, and can pray. But one that is unto death is one that he refuses to repent of. So why did you come up with that idea? From the Bible. Let's look at two examples. One that says you can't pray, and one says uh, indicates that you can. Jeremiah. God, what did you tell Jeremiah about the people of his day? Therefore, pray not thou for this people. Neither lift up cry nor prayer for them. Make, neither make intercession to me. Now there's an intercessory prayer. That's 1 John 1 right down the line. I will not hear thee. Don't pray for them. Isn't that what John says don't do? Don't pray for one. How do I see it? It's, uh, unto, it's unto death. And how can I see that? Well, these people were practicing idolatry. That's the context. And these people in the streets of Judah and Jerusalem, they got the whole family. The children are gathering wood. The, the father is kindling the fire. The mother is kneading dough, making cakes, and offering up to the queen of heaven. And they're offering up their drink offering to the gods. Whole family affair. And what they've done, they've kindled my anger, says God. And they have confusion in their face. Therefore, saith the Lord Jehovah, my anger and my wrath shall be poured out upon this place. Upon man and beast, upon trees and the fruit of the ground. And you won't quench this fire, God says. It's coming. These people were not willing to repent from their idolatry. What is ahead of them is the judgment of God. And God says, don't pray for them, Jeremiah. In essence, it's not my will. Peter and Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer is a baptized believer. He believed and he was baptized in Acts 8. But he wanted to buy the gifts that the apostles had. Not the spiritual gifts they were given. I want to have the power of the apostles that when I lay my hands upon someone, I can transfer these miraculous gifts. I want that. And he offered them money. Your heart's not right, Peter says. He says, repent therefore of this thy wickedness. And pray the Lord. If perhaps the fault of thy heart shall be forgiven thee. What an idea. Well, I can't pray for you. But that's what he exhorts him to do. So what is the, Peter says his view of Simon is. I see that thou art in the gall of bitterness. And the bond of iniquity. Please be impressed. With the consequences of one sin. Nobody's overlooking sin. Not even one sin. What did this one sin do? There's this gall, this bitterness that you're, manu that you're manifesting. It's, your, it's really going to be troubling to the other people around. And you're in a bond of iniquity. No hope. And you know what Simon wanted? Pray for me. Now we're in intercessory prayer. Peter, I want you to pray for me. Can Peter pray for him? Pray for me, Lord, to the Lord, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. I thought you're already in it. You're in it. I don't want these things to come upon me. 
That's instructive. What does that mean? It means that being in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity, was a curse that's lying upon them. That if something's not done about their repentance, it's going to continue to be upon them until everlasting death. I don't want these things to come upon me. Because we're speaking of a curse. Now let's notice an interesting point here. We'll bring this together. Won't you ask, answer me, how is this true? I can pray for one who is not sinning unto death, and what will be the answer to the prayer? I'll give him life. I didn't think I needed life. I, didn't, I don't die. I didn't pray. I didn't sin unto death. Then how come you're going to give me life? If we're thinking spiritual life, spiritual death, we're in trouble. If we're thinking about eternal life and eternal death, we're right on target. I'll give you life. I'll put you back and restore unto you this eternal life. Because what you're in now, this is a curse that's upon you. That if that's not corrected, it is eternal death. You didn't sin unto eternal death because you still have an opportunity to do something about it. But I'm going to give you eternal life. I'm going to put you back in store of eternal life. And that's what we see with this idea of gall of bitterness. It's a curse that's lying upon them that needs to be taken care of. So the effects of that curse will not come upon them. In Deuteronomy 29... I think we find this, this makes it pretty clear. In Deuteronomy 29, you have people, again, individuals that are going to be connected with idolatry. In verse 29, verses 18, 18 through 20, we'll find that the people are, have, uh, have this attitude that I want us to, to see. Lest there should be among you a man or a woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from Jehovah our God to serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. You're going, and, 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 and it'll come to pass that he heareth the words of this curse. He bless himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the stubbornness of my, my heart. So here is this Go, it's going to affect others. It's going to destroy the moist with the dry. But in their heart, it says, I'll continue this way. I will bless myself. As I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, it will destroy the moist with the dry. Jehovah said unto him, But then the anger of Jehovah and the jealousy will smoke against that man. And all the curse that is written in this book, shall lie upon him. Here is this curse, gall, wormwood, bitterness. It's going, then it's going to come to fruition in their life if they don't change their stubborn ways. It says, and all the curse that has written this book shall lie upon him, and Jehovah will blot out his name from under heaven. That sounds like eternal death to me. And the sorceress says, I don't want this to happen to me. What's on me? The curse. Now, what was his attitude? Stubborn? I'll continue to do what I want to. I'll get, I'll get, I'll get somebody has a price. They'll give me, I'll, I'll pay, I'll get that gift. No. He said, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm seeing him sin a sin that's not unto death. He needs to be restored to eternal life because he's got the curse of eternal death on him. Will it come? It depends on my attitude toward those things. We can pray for our brother who repents. God will restore him to the eternal life that's promised from the Father in Jesus Christ. Relationship to God? I need to believe on his name. I have eternal life. This is written so I may know I have it. My relationship to man... If I don't love him, I'm just like a murderer. And no murderer hath eternal life continuing to abide in him. And when I see a brother that's sinning, and it's not unto eternal death in the sense that he can make corrections. 
He has an attitude that I will correct. He'll be restored to eternal life that he has as he keeps on striving to serve the Lord. But the one who remains to be stubborn and will not repent or even will not confess that he said, I'm not to pray for that person. That's what Jeremiah was told to do. And so may we understand the difference between life and death. When you hate your brother, you're walking in death even until now. That's eternal death in its, in its end. We can have life, eternal life. But we're going to have to come to Christ on his terms. Do you believe on the authority of Christ to save you? Do you believe and trust in his death and resurrection to save you from your sins? Then you're ready to say, I, I believe that I'm willing, I'm willing to confess that. Confess him to be the son of God so you can have this eternal life. And then be made alive when you are buried in waters of baptism into Christ's death. So because of his resurrection, which you're trusting in, you'll be raised to walk in a newness of life. And what I want us to see, what's the nature of that life? It's eternal in its nature. Keep on believing. Jesus says you will never die. Never die. You might need to be restored, restored to that place of eternal life, but you'll never die if you keep on believing. And you can have the confidence of heaven. If you're subject to the gospel invitation anyway, we appreciate you listening. In fact, I want you to obey and make the decision as we stand and sing. Please come.